everybody. Whew, my inner critic is telling me don't follow Mary Jo, but I have no choice. Um, I am so excited to be here. Um, I am beyond honored that uh, TEDx Brentwood invited me to be here today to share my story. Now, I am a writer, an artist, a curator, and I have an inner critic who is a jerk. These are just a few of the gems my inner critic likes to throw out in situations just like this. Um, <laughs> when, I was in, uh, when I was a kid, I was the art kid. But, um, you know, I, I didn't, hadn't met my inner critic yet. So I wanted to know, out of you guys, who hears that little voice that stops them? Anybody? Okay, now look around. See, none of us, none of us are alone in this. I thought I was alone, but no more. Now, I stand up on the stage, I write books, I go into my art studio every single day, and I wear this. <laughs> now, I didn't really meet my inner critic until I was 21 years old. Before that, my head was filled with happy, artsy little thoughts. My mom tells the story of a little Danielle sitting in her high chair creating masterpiece after masterpiece. Prodigy? Perhaps. <laughs> this is titled Big Bird, Tiny Tree, 1977. <laughs> I was the art kid. I sewed my own toys. I made paintings for all my friends, even if they wanted store-bought birthday gifts. Um, and in high school, I was on the yearbook committee. All good. So off I went to art school. It did not go well. The art kid did not fit in at art school. Was this when I met my inner critic? No. Nope. I actually still thought that I was pretty clever, so I just sort of continued on. However, six weeks before I graduated with a BFA in painting, I was heading into a critique. Has anybody experienced an art critique in here? Yes, so you know what I'm talking about. So in I went to my art critique to hang the five pieces that would be in my final grad show. I hung them. Now, the professor in this class was not a huge fan of mine, and um, that was fine. I'd learned to defend myself. I'd, I'd gained a thicker skin, which is actually part of art school, so that was fine. So I hung the work and was prepared to be bashed, but he loved it a lot. I was so thrilled, so thrilled, in fact, that when he asked for three people to volunteer to show their work the following week to a visiting artist from New York, I volunteered. So one week later, I hung the same paintings I'd shown the week before and sat down to be ready for a 10-minute critique. Well, that critique lasted 30 minutes in which I was completely torn apart by my classmates and the professor who said that he'd loved it a week before. Now, normally I was good at defending myself. I was so blindsided, I, I did this and tried really hard not to cry. And at about 23 minutes into that 30 minutes, my painting prof said to me, a painting major about to graduate, you should never paint again. So, in case you're wondering, yes, this is when I met my inner critic. <laughs> so I graduated and hightailed it out of the art world. I went to design school, became a graphic designer, and eventually a very successful creative director. It was also a really great place to hide out and not make my own artwork for a very, very long time. Now, my inner critic never really showed up in the design studio for some reason, but when I would come home and try and make art, all I could hear were my professor's words and that very blunt statement, you should never paint again. Over time, that voice, his voice faded and it just became its own entity and a really big jerk. I was blocked, I was scared, and I was making excuses like they were going out of style. Here's a few I like to pull out of my pocket. The light in here is terrible. I can't make anything today. This paper isn't quite right, so I can't make anything today. That idea isn't perfect yet, so clearly I can't make anything today. And all of this is just really frivolous and a huge waste of time, so I can never make anything ever again. I think it's that final one that makes me the most mad. Creativity is frivolous. 
Oh yeah? Tell that to Picasso or Shakespeare or any other creative professional for that matter. We all have to think about where did that come from though? Because there is no kid in the history of the world who ever said, hmm, I think that this glitter and macaroni craft is a huge waste of my morning. This is the kind of junk that our inner critic throws out. The words that your inner critic gives you is really just a collection of fear-based words from a very insecure bully. We all need to put on matching shirts, march in a little circle, and say no to bullying. Now, the inner critic is not that different from a bully on a playground. They have their go-to jabs that they know are going to get you. So you heard what mine had to say at the beginning of all of this. But I wanted to know what other people heard. So I put it out to my Facebook and Instagram community just to see. And I thought maybe I'd get 20 back. Within an hour and a half, I had over 550 comments. Do you know who is the most unoriginal, uncreative thinker? Inner critics. Of those over 550 comments, there were really only a handful of things that came up over and over again. Here they are. You have nothing meaningful to say. You're just adding to the bleeping noise. You're going to fail anyway, you loser. Don't waste time trying. There are so many people that are so much better than you. You're tired. Just start tomorrow. Wow, you are so effing lazy. Does that look familiar to anybody? OK, so we're going to do a little exercise. I want you to pick the one that sounds most like your inner critic. If your inner critic's jab is not up there, you know what it is, and I want you to get it in your mind. OK? Now I want everyone to stand up. Turn to the person beside you. Decide who's going to go first. OK, listen, listen. And in, with the most attitude you can muster, yell. Take those words out of your head and yell them at that other person. And then they'll yell it back to you. Have a seat, have a seat. <laughs> now, would you ever say something like that to a stranger or a friend? No. So, oh, you would? Oh. So, <laughs> why on earth do we say this to ourselves? It is bullying, it's emotional abuse, and it is not okay. I allowed that one moment in my undergrad to give my inner critic life. And over the last few years with writing the books and traveling, I've had the opportunity to talk to so many creative people. And I've sort of come down to four tricks that have helped make my inner critic, well, less of a jerk. Oh, uh, yeah. This is when I wrote my first book, but my inner critic didn't actually think that I did. But when I wrote my first book, um, I reached out to an artist named Amanda Happe from Toronto, and I asked her how she deals with negative criticism. And she said this, no one can wrestle the pencil out of your hand, you get to keep going in absolute defiance. I cried. More than 15 years after that experience in university, I finally realized that it wasn't my professor that stopped me. I put my paintbrush down. It was my responsibility to pick it up the next day and the day after that, and the day after that. That was also the day I decided that my inner critic was going to no longer be in charge. So these are the four tips that I want to pass on to you so that hopefully your inner critic won't be in charge anymore either. Copy the experts. Professional artists, musicians, writers, they must have it made, right? They would certainly never second guess themselves, but they do. They all have inner critics. However, they also have a few very important things that we can totally steal. Dedication. They make work whether it ends up on the gallery wall, on the stage, in a novel, or in the garbage can. They make work every single day. Time. They give themselves space and time to be creative. Being creative isn't at the bottom of their priority list. Being creative is their priority. 
If you have time to watch Netflix or comment on Instagram, you have time to be creative. And trust. Over the years, these professionals have sort of developed this relationship with their inner critic. They become friends. Friends that don't really like each other very much, but they both have the same goal. Great work. So when they hear that little voice, you know, pipe up, they know that they're probably headed down the wrong path. Okay, tip number two, give it a name. So, confession time. I actually really hate the term inner critic, even though it is the title of this talk. It seems almost impossible to take anything that is 50% critic and turn it into anything remotely warm and fuzzy. So I was speaking at a conference a couple of years ago and I met a high school student and he said that he calls his inner critic Arlo. I want an inner critic named Arlo. Sure, Arlo might have a bad day from time to time, but I feel like we have a better shot at being friends than me and my inner critic. So if you don't have another name for yours, I suggest you come up with something cute and unthreatening, maybe Gordon or Lydia. Um, whatever works for you. That way you can kind of tell Gordon to take a seat. Three, say thank you. This sounds ridiculously easy, but it is actually really hard. When somebody compliments you, say thank you, instead of giving them an itemized list of flaws. For example, if someone says, oh, I love that drawing, and you say, well, I don't love that top part, and I didn't really have the pencil that I wanted to use, your inner critic will be in heaven. To shut Gordon and or Lydia down, simply say, thank you, and practice being proud of yourself, even if you are completely faking it at first. Every time you do this, your inner critic loses a bit of power, which is exactly what we want. And finally, translate and rewrite. So, bedside manner is not exactly a strong suit of the inner critic. There might be a bit of truth there, but because the message is being delivered by an asshole, it's really hard to listen. <laughs> so put your gloves down, take a deep breath, and then translate and rewrite what it said. So, let's try it on Arlo. You're not Elizabeth frickin' Gilbert. Yes, I realize that. She is a smart, articulate author whom I admire. But you know what? So is Danielle frickin' Krissa. All of us have something important to say, sh stories we want to share, and we should do that no matter what the jerks have to say. So let's take, this was the number one landslide winner from, uh, from Facebook and Instagram. You're going to fail, don't waste time trying. Youch. So we change it to this. Oh, I'm going to fail, like a genius. Fail, experiment, learn, play, repeat. That is actually how geniuses become geniuses. You need time to become a genius and you need to fail along the way. The next time your inner critic pipes up, I want you to stop whatever you're doing and jot it on a little card. Immediately flip it over and write the positive opposite. Stick that on your fridge, your bathroom mirror, your studio wall. And before you know it, you'll be completely surrounded by supportive statements that shut Gordon and Lydia and Arlo up. And finally, I just wanted to say, you know, if you guys take all of these points, you put them together, you're going to have an entirely new relationship with this little voice. Little being the key word. Sure, it'll probably tag along with you everywhere you go, but step up on the stage and wear whatever you want because you look fabulous. Thank you.